A while back, I played the Nintendo Switch remake of Live Alive. Debuting in 1994 and developed by Square Enix, this RPG told seven distinct stories spanning across seven different time periods, all tied together by one ultimate baddie, the Lord of Dark Odio, and his several incarnations. It was originally a Japan exclusive title, but it grabbed the attention of a lot of Western gamers thanks to fan translations, and one of the game's tracks, Megalomania. If that sounds familiar, it should. It's all starting to make sense. Fortunately for us, the demand was enough to constitute keeping the hype for this game alive. I get what I paid for my team, whether I like it or not. And in the summer of 2022, the world was graced with the global release of Live Alive. Each new chapter definitely gave me something to think about, some for the right reasons, others... Oh, well, we'll get to that later. So I decided to try something a little different and rank each chapter from favorite to least favorite. I'll be ordering each chapter based on the following factors. The main character's personality, role in the story, and gameplay. If we're stuck with them, gotta make sure we like them, right? What each chapter's gimmicks and themes are. This is especially important since they're all based on different timelines and genres. How are the supporting cast and villains? The atmosphere for each chapter. Does it make you feel like you're actually there? And finally, the length and content i.e. is its shortness too short, or is it so long that it feels like padding? That out of the way, let's get to it. Here's how I rank each chapter for Square Enix's Live Alive. For those that don't know, Live Alive, along with Earthbound, is one of the games that Toby Fox credited as the inspiration for Undertale. Particularly, one chapter of Live Alive is an obvious inspiration for Undertale's pacifist, neutral, and genocide routes. With that said, fuck Twilight of Edo Japan! Okay, 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 I'm getting ahead of myself. Mm -mm. Fuck so, you are the shinobi Oboromuru. You have to use your ninja skills to rescue a VIP. Yep, it's a stealth mission. If you think that's the biggest reason why this chapter infuriates me so, oh, trust me when I say that is a single soggy strawberry in this sh swirl smoothie. The first problem is that this stupid place is a maze. It's freaking enormous. And it's not always clear if you can go one certain direction. I'll say this though. Scenery's gorgeous. I mean that honestly. The lighting, the layout, everything about this chapter's imagery is beautiful. So at least you have something pretty to look at while you're flippin' lost. Oh, and if you're trying to do the pacifist route, well, don't you dare follow directions. You know that really helpful orange diamond on the minimap they added in the remake? The thing that single-handedly prevented anyone from getting lost? Well, if you go to it, the guy is a fake. Oh, and it's a fight that you can't run from, so if you didn't save beforehand, you have to start over. Are we having fun yet? And don't you dare talk to the wrong people or explore the area to try and get more info. Otherwise, it might trigger an unfleeable fight. Oh, and for shame if you foolishly show compassion to people because giving food to someone starving in the prison is just another stupid trap. So, follow directions? Punished. Explore? Punished. Try to be nice? Punished. And yes, this is a Apparently, what inspired Undertale's pacifist, neutral, and genocide runs. My verdict... Well, that was utterly horrendous. Thank you. It's especially frustrating because what this game deems as pacifist is really freaking arbitrary. Oh no, you can't kill anyone. But ghosts? Sure, you can kill those. And yokai? Oh yeah, f*** the yokai and this puppeteer dude in particular. He doesn't count despite sentience and a crippling fear of death. Only living human lives matter. Except that they don't. Because of this, you see this? You have to go through these guys one way or another. No sneaking around. The non-pacifist way is just walking up to them and giving them a quick, merciful death via sword slice. So what's the pacifist route on this? You have to go through a really bonkers and complicated side quest that you will need a guide to get through, get a clone puppet, bring it up there without breaking it. Yeah, that's a thing that can happen. And walk up to those guys. Then the puppet, for no freaking reason, just runs up to them and explodes. That is the pacifist route. Yeah, that morally confused Batman Begins bullcrap of, I don't have to kill you, but I don't have to save you either. Oh no, killing someone yourself? 
bad. But building a freaking bomb and letting it do the job? Totally fine! And your reward for doing things pacifist? You get an awesome sword that you can't freaking use in the chapter. You can only use it in a future chapter where you go through another tedious maze to get the good ending and get an even better weapon. So going through this maze, pacifist is a complete waste of time. This reward feels like an insult. Nearly everything about this chapter seems designed to piss you off. And I hate how people describe it as complex, as if that's some sort of positive in this context. No, if complexity is dumb Easter eggs, convoluted side missions, confused morality, and the game picking on you as if this is Gary Gygax's sequel to the Tomb of Horrors, then yes, it's a complex mixed bag. Believe it or not, the original version of this chapter was worse. You had to recall the password manually, and you got no hits from Majibio Nosuke and Muramasa. So, it's got that going for it. It's also fair to say that this is the best looking chapter. As I mentioned, it's gorgeous. Look at this. Also, I do like some of the puzzles, particularly the wheel one. The final boss has a delightfully disturbing design, and the twist that the guy you're saving is an actual historical figure is pretty cool. Also, fun fact, one of the bosses is voiced by Suki from Avatar The Last Airbender. My girlfriend was in Twilight of Edo, Japan. That's rough, buddy. But those bits are not nearly enough to carry what was ultimately an incredibly frustrating chapter of annoying trial and error gameplay. That's why I'll never forgive the Japanese! Okay, so this next bit's not going to have nearly as much anger. All the other chapters from here on out are at least above average in terms of overall quality. Don't misunderstand me. This chapter is good, and I bet when it appears, I'm gonna get some shocked reactions, but something has to go above Twilight of Edo Japan. And to be done, partner. One thing each chapter does really well is establish a tone and atmosphere. This one is no different. It's very much a classic Western. The plot feels very similar to Magnificent Seven. A stranger rolls into town, being troubled by outlaws, and has to protect the harsh but hospitable townsfolk. And what you know, his rival is also there. Oh, and I cannot talk about this chapter without this absolute oof. Let me guess. It's not that you hate milk, but that you can't stomach it, lest it's fresh from your mother's tits. Your mother's, maybe. <laughs> In Live Alive, each chapter also has a gimmick of sorts. In Twilight of Edo Japan, it was the stealth. For this one, there's a time limit. You only have a limited window to grab a bunch of items and set traps for the main villain. Now, this is something easy to pick up. Grab everything you can. Simple, right? What isn't easy to pick up is you don't set the traps yourself and you give them to others. And these Others have different timings to set things up, and it's not always very clear who's fast at setting things up and who isn't. Sure, you could deduce a few people's skills, and I don't mind having to intuit a few things, but some require trial and error, and I'm not really a fan of having to play through something multiple times to get the best outcome. Though, to be fair, maybe I'm overreacting. If you miss a few traps, it's not a huge deal since it's absolutely possible to beat the boss with his entire entourage. But couldn't we have at least gotten some, I don't know, better hints towards who's best at what? Not like a super obvious loading screen tip, give X I am to Y character, but maybe some more lines of dialogue? Like, did you hear about the time Andy knocked that feller out with the frying pan? I guess I'm just mostly annoyed that this chapter feels more fetch questy and combat feels like an afterthought. You can only end this chapter at level 2, which makes spoilery bits more of a pain in the butt. At the very least, the actual boss fight is still great. Odeo is an interesting opponent, with his Gatling gun making for a very positional battle. But, I don't know, I guess the twist at the end regarding him felt a little weak and, dare I say, silly. Other than that, I guess my last substantial complaint is that Sundown isn't that interesting of a character. He's not unlikable or anything, I just feel he's a bit 
lacking in development compared to other protagonists. All of them got good development despite the short length, while Sundown kinda just stays the same. Now, I know that's part of the Western parody, you know, the mysterious silent stranger. And that's true. But the issue is that a lot of these mysterious strangers in Westerns or even Western parodies have big or interesting personalities to compensate. Sundown, unfortunately, doesn't have much for us to chew on other than, you know, making history's first Yo Mama joke. I don't know, maybe give us a little more backstory. That way, him teaming up with Mad Dog would have felt a lot more significant. We're told there's a rivalry, and there's a bit you can theorize if you squint harder than Clint Eastwood, but it just isn't enough. Honestly, I think I might have just sabotaged myself here, because this was the first chapter I played, and it's honestly not a great one to start with when learning how the game works, because look how the chapter is structured. Maybe if I played it later, I'd have more positive feelings like the rest of the fandom, but I don't know. Well, now that we settled the age-old question of cowboys versus ninjas, it's time to decide if Freddy Flintstone and his merry crew can rise to their own occasion. Yes, we're going back in time to the Stone Age, where no words are spoken and the gorillas make fun of us constantly. Prehistory is probably the simplest chapter in the game and consequently, the best chapter to start with. You are given characters with simple movesets and it eases you into the combat with a tutorial or two and the ability to lay traps something that becomes very important in other chapters, as you know. Prehistory in and of itself is a pretty harmless romp. It has a simple premise, an Oonga Boonga boy meets an Oonga Boonga girl, and then spends the whole time protecting her from a tribe of Oonga Boonga woman sacrificers hoping to get his own rocks off. Now, rocks isn't a euphemism, it's the Stone Age, come on guys. Yeah, okay, it's a euphemism. Look, sometimes the rock puns don't fit too well, buddy. You want the package or not? Your main character, Pogo, is a pretty good starter protagonist too. He's what you'd expect a teen caveman to act like. He doesn't take anything seriously and runs purely on instinct. And when he sees a hot girl for the first time, he acts as any lusting teen would. In the Stone Age, I need to preface that. He goes to large lengths for her too. Getting exiled from his village, infiltrating the enemy tribe's village, single-handedly defeats most of their warriors, and defeats the strongest warrior solo twice for her honor. One thing I find really cool about this chapter is the lack of dialogue. Everything is told in gestures and grunts. You'd think it'd be hard to understand, but it works. Also, trying to figure out how to craft was a fun little game to intuit. The upgraded hardware makes this even easier to enjoy. Makes it fun to watch, even with the potty humor being a bit grating at times. It is probably the most classic JRPG of the chapters in theming and story. I do have a couple of nitpicks though. One, the humor. While it can be smart humor on occasion, like how the healing song is annoying, but the hurting song sounds pretty, it also gets a bit cringy. Yes, I'm talking about the Mario's. Like Master of Disguise, it only works twice and then fails the rest of the time. Two, the environment is pretty ugly. I know, it's the Stone Age. It's hard to make wastelands pretty, but they did it well in Wild West, kind of. Three, this one's definitely a bit more of a grind fest. I mean, I'm sometimes okay with Grindfest, but the infantile humor and bleh visuals don't make it super bearable. There's also a really unfortunate bit that happened with the localization. See, love in Japanese is I. So at the end of the chapter, when Pogo is <clears throat> making I to Baru, he shouts the word. The idea, and also joke here, is that the only communication people have done up to this point is grunting and gestures. The first word ever spoken in history is supposed to be love. A neat idea to contrast the name odio, which in Latin means hate. Well, the issue is that they left it in the original Japanese. So he's just shouting I all the time and it's never given any actual context other than him <clears throat> finishing the chapter. Similar to Wild West, prehistory is here because of the process of elimination. There's gotta be something that goes into the number seven spot. Part of it was the lackluster visuals, but it was mostly the infantile humor. Does that make me petty? Yes. Yes, it does. Wanna get the rock out of here? Rock ya. Yeah. Present day, <laughs> present time. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> With the semi-obscure anime reference out of the way, let's talk about present day. In this chapter, you play as Masaru, a young man aiming to be the very best. No one ever. No, martial artist. Naturally, he has to prove this by fighting a bunch of other people all across the world. So yeah, as you can tell, this is a Street Fighter parody. This would normally be the part where I talk about the flaws, but there really aren't any. This chapter has its surprises and it has a great tone. It's just the others reach much higher emotional peaks. It's completely solid. It does its job. Seven out of 10. This is easily one of the more unique chapters in terms of combat. You don't have any items, experience, or even other party members. Every battle is an intense one-on-one -on -one duel, so you really feel the weight of every action. Each of your opponents make use of signature moves, and it's incredibly satisfying to learn them for yourself. They're all really fun characters as well, being parodies of real-life wrestlers and martial artists. Plus, they're all really good sports about losing, so the gut punch at the end hurts all the more. Yeah, the villain just up and murders every single fighter and mocks the main character for not having the gonads to kill them. And when you do fight him, it's wicked hype. Being able to use the moves of your fallen opponents makes the feeling of avenging them so satisfying. And yeah, we don't get to spend as much time with Masaru as I would like so we can learn more about him. I empathized with his righteous fury at the cold-blooded murders. Okay, I changed my mind. There is one flaw with this chapter. Odie O'Bright is such a stupid name. Oh, look, the evil murdering martial artist's name is Odie O'Bright. Top of the morning to you, laddies. My name's Odie O'Bright, and I'm gonna kill you all. You gotta give the voice actor a lot of credit. He's really trying to make the name sound intimidating, but come on. There's no saving something as goofy as... Odie O'Bright! But enough of me being mean. All in all, this chapter is incredibly short, but it never overstays its welcome. The whole thing can be finished in less than an hour, but it manages to cram so much good stuff in. It's like being able to play a 90s martial arts anime. Also, is that Ken's theme I hear? One of the best things about this game is how good it is at keeping you on edge with what can and what will happen. Prehistory and Twilight of Edo Japan are softer in tone, which makes the turning points of Wild West and present day more jarring. It works vice versa by giving us less tense chapters after the harsh ones. It's important to keep that in mind when taking a step into Imperial China. The premise of this chapter is that you're a Shifu looking to pass his martial arts wisdom onto a successor as his own days are numbered. He finds three promising protégés, a gluttonous yet durable young man, an agile female bandit, and a frail pickpocket with budding potential. You spend your time with them, training their strength, bulk, and speed each day. And who knows, perhaps the one you train the best will prove to be your greatest achievement. Despite being the Kung Fu chapter, the combat aspect of this game is weirdly kind of light at the start. You only encounter a few enemy types all around, and most of the chapter is spent on training your students. Well, training. I don't want part of beating them up daily increases their stats, but hey, I'm not the martial arts master. Who am I to judge? The lack of variety does contribute to some of the later fights in the chapter being really drawn out and repetitive. There are a few unique enemies at the end, but... Why couldn't we get those sooner? That's really my only complaint with this chapter though. Everything else is spot on. The visuals of this chapter are impeccable. Everything from the airy mountains to the saturated greenery of the bamboo forest and the cultural aesthetics of the villages. The Shifu's house and the palace of the Indomitable Fist. Ah, it all looks so good. Oh, and don't even get me started on the music. That somber flute really does the tone of this chapter justice, conveying the calming atmosphere and even the sad tone that comes in later parts of the story. You gotta love the Journey to the West reference too. Come on, you cannot tell me that these three aren't obviously Monkey, Pigsy, and Sandy. 
Okay, you probably can if you look up the wiki, but that's cheating. Go study culture or just watch OSP, but yeah. But those aren't the only animals in the room. The big elephant that stomps all but one takes the highlight of this tragic tale. If you play this chapter blind, you probably want it to spread out your training, give every student an equal chance to get stronger while still maybe favoring one over the others. It makes it so much of a punch in the gut when you find out the one you trained the most is the only one that makes it out alive. Each of these characters have their own personal lives and ambitions, and training them never stopped you from seeing more of their plight. Finding out that some of them won't see the end of their journey is pretty heartbreaking. And that is why it's so much more satisfying when you get to take your successful student to the end and tear the indomitable fist down. It's definitely a strong chapter on the aesthetic and emotion. Although let's face it, once you know how the game chooses which ones live, it becomes a matter of deciding which ones die. So you chuck all the training on your favorite while leaving the other two to starve. Kinda mean. All right, we did caveman, ninjas, cowboys, kung fu masters, and street fighter. What next? Just plain anime BS? Yeah, that sounds about right. Near Future is pretty much a mecha anime with psychics. Let's see, we start off with a monologue from the main character about how his life went to hell? Check. Main character started developing psychic abilities after a significant trauma? Check. Best friend and older brother figure is a biker with a dumb alias? Check. We get a turtle robot partner that is piloted by the liquidated remains of our sister's dying turtle? Check! Wait, what? While the tone shifts in the previous chapters really put you on edge, Near Future is just all over the place in tone. It starts out the sad backstory, but the tone quickly changes to a snarky teen protagonist fighting a biker gang and an anime intro song that gives more Ultraman vibes than a Power Rangers spinoff. And then it goes from there to a military cult sacrificing humans to a dark bird god. On the one hand, yay, mecha anime parody. Wait, mecha animes include Evangelion. Fuck! How did I not see the body horror coming? The main character's named Akira for crying out loud. Speaking of, Akira starts off as a turd. He's stubborn. He's abrasive. Makes one of the other orphans into his errand boy and is always getting into fights. I'll be honest, I hated him at the start. But what I appreciate is as the story continues, you meet new characters and he gets so much better. First off, we have Dr. Tobai, who looks like at the Candy King from Wreck-It Ralph got his doctorate from Dr. Eggman. And yes, he's the one who turned our sister's turtle into soup and made it into a robot. Oh, I just love wholesome body horror. And then he introduces us to the Steel Titan and it becomes mecha anime BS again. Then the biker gang kidnaps one of the orphans, and the cruel biker bestie Lawless, yes, that is his alias, helps you get him back. While you're there, you hear about a laboratory. Oh no, mecha anime and laboratories never mesh well. Most of the lab seems pretty okay, until you find a server room with a bunch of giant containers that you can read the minds of. If that doesn't directly invoke I have no mouth and I must scream, I don't know what does. And we confront the leaders of the bikers only to find out they're a cult who wants to resurrect an evil god. And we want to fight them, but instead, they make us fight a robot being controlled by an orphan's father as a liquefacted human. And yes, when you destroy the robot, the goo that is his father's consciousness just spills out all over the floor. Cheese and rice! It gets worse. The cult succeeds in resurrecting their god, and the only way to defeat them is with the Steel Titan. While Lawless tries to use it but fails because of the lack of psychic powers. He uses some enhancers to juice up his psychic energy, but dies in the process. Before he does, he tells Akira that he was the one who killed his father. Akira, troubled and saddened by learning the truth and seeing the closest thing he had to another father die in front of him, he musters all the energy he has to go Super Saiyan and pilot the robot. This is probably the most hype megalomania fight. Akira succeeds and was able to destroy the god and the cult. However, after he wins, the lake of liquefied humans, yes, that's still a thing, almost sucks up Akira and the robot. And it ends with Akira on a park bench and selling Taiyaki and Lawless's stead. All right, it's a mecha anime, and that includes Evangelion. Great. 
Now look, this chapter can understandably be very polarizing. I bet that people familiar with the game were surprised I ranked it so high, especially above Imperial China. And yeah, I don't blame you. I thought I was being crazy too, but the more I thought about it, I just loved it that much. The theming and the atmosphere, and especially in the second half, are just that good. Yeah, Akira took a little bit of getting used to, but I ended up liking him in the end. I also surprisingly enjoyed the complicated story, and even if the ending was a bit off, I honestly found it hilarious, because of course it would do that. Still better than the Evangelion movies, am I right? hey -o! Okay, yeah, this might catch you off guard. I mean, Middle Ages not being atop the rank? Surely a good explanation for this you have, Josh! Well, I hope you accept change in the form of subjective opinions, because that's about all I can offer. But we'll get to that later. Middle Ages is THE chapter that absolutely rocked the players of this game, and chances are, it's what made them undying fans. You unlock this chapter after you beat the other seven, so whatever this one has to offer must be really special. And it is! At first, it's more of the traditional JRPG fare. You play as a heroic knight, become romantically involved with a princess, she gets captured, and you have to rescue her. You're even joined by the standard RPG team, a mage, a cleric, and a warrior. Too bad there isn't a thief. Or is there? There were some interesting choices made for this chapter. The vocabulary is pretty thick on ye olden tongue, though not quite Shakespearean level. Some people might like it, while others have found it to be a bit much. Me? I dare say it's time such tongues find light again. Nonetheless, characters great exist still. Strabo charming and keen, Uranus wise and calming, Hash hardened for reasons deeper than seemed, and Ersted a legend in the making. As tale we tread, elements of tradition crumble, our lies fell, mission remained unsolved, and conspiracies arose. Ersted, once beloved and renowned knight, slandered and exiled. Those once cheered hated him. All that can be done is scour hope remaining and reminders of comrades. Look ne'er lesser forward, for the love of Princess Althea is worth the struggle. Marching on, frightened knights our hero tramples. Demons did he slay, steps he traces back to the summit of the Lord of Dark. Sweat on his face, blood on his sword, bring him where it does. A confrontation with old friend, traitor, and rival of love for the princess. Incel that Strabo, accused Ersted of arrogance and pride after Alethea tormented by his delusion and entitlement. No loyalty is there to pay for, as Ersted slaughters the foolish fiend. However, all is not well afterward. Distraught, Alethea grew resentment for Ersted's sloth. Pity Strabo she did for his false dedication. Hope of Ersted perishes before his eyes, as the princess's life she did renounce. No aid of friends left to seek, no people left to appeal. No home to return to. Ersted surrenders to the bounding chain like a helpless dog. What all reviled him as he became. The darkness. The sin. The hate. Odio. So, understanding this I am. Imprudent mage, cucked in olden era, brought upon generations of paradox, carving path for lineage of malice, drawing breath of dying from imposter Hulk Hogan. Such as live alive, my good people! Twisty vocabs aside, I think it's clear why this chapter got the acclaim that it did. On top of being a strong subversion to a story tradition that lasted even now, it really drives in how tragic of a story our main character goes through. Even more painful that it all happened in one day. That's how far the world is from where I am. Just one bad day. If Imperial China is a gut punch, this feels like it's ripping your heart out and stomping it. Ersted's voice just nails the climax. Darquatas, you killed it. We really feel the despair Ersted goes through after all he lost. A lot of my problems with this chapter are 
mostly nitpicks. The random encounters plus the backtracking can get a little annoying. It's also a bit weird that Erston never defended himself after accidentally killing the king. He just stayed silent. I mean, to be fair, realistically speaking, nothing would have changed. But again, realistically speaking, anyone would have said something. And I know that it's supposed to serve the whole silent protag doesn't speak until the big thing at the end, but uh, it's still jarring, especially because before this, we hear him speak in combat. If they wanted to maintain the illusion, they should have kept him silent through those parts. I guess my biggest annoyance and what brings it down to number three for me is, dear lord, does this chapter love repeating previous cutscenes over and over? Hey, Square! I'm not an idiot who needs to be spoon-fed previous lines being recontextualized. This chapter can be finished in less than three hours and I don't have the memory of a goldfish. But me overreacting aside, an amazing chapter with an iconic gem of a twist. Even with today's culture of it's still incredibly effective. Top that with the mountain's refined atmosphere and a remix of Demon King Odeo almost truly faithful to the original, and we got ourselves a highlight in a museum of reanimated cult classics. According to my colleagues, Cube is best waifu. Uh, that's a tone setter. How often do you see sci-fi horror actually having a great focus on characters and themes? Sure, it's fun to hone in on the scary aliens and creepy AI, but what about the humane aspects? You know, the actual basis to fear these threats to begin with. I think that's a big part of what makes the distant future chapter so interesting. In this chapter, you play as a little support robot helping out with tasks around the cargo spaceship Kogito Ergo Sum. Yeah, uh, on the nose as usual, Live Alive. On the ship, you meet crew members like Rachel Klein, Kirk Wells, Huey Trumbull, Corporal Duck. Ace Attorney, I'm sorry I ever made fun of you. The longer you stick around, conflict sparks as crew members are slowly but surely getting picked off one by one. It's up to the little robot to investigate the strange happenings around the ship. As an homage to pillars of sci-fi horror like Alien and 2001 A Space Odyssey, this chapter excels at tension. The way it builds fear and suspense through the lack of music, the dark corridors of the ship, and the mystery surrounding every crewmate's well-being. There wasn't much of anything in your face at the start, but it sets up really well once the behemoth enters the scene. You only get brief moments encountering it, but the paranoia, knowing it can pounce you anywhere, dealing with sudden roadblocks, and again, barely any music, you mostly just get howling and footsteps, it's just... Whoo! Metro Fusion would be proud! Granted, the behemoth is kind of easy to avoid, so there isn't any big strategy other than running into the nearest open room to avoid it. So we're not quite alien isolation levels of complexity with the hiding mechanics, but really, if that's the biggest complaint I have with this chapter, that's a sign how excellent everything else is. And yeah, funny names aside, characters are really good here. They're all fleshed out and each have their own personal needs and conflicting motives. Makes for some pretty intricate scenes when they're manipulated into doubting each other. Deliberately or not, it's a testament to how humans overcome their weaknesses and differences in order to trust each other and survive. The emotions on display here are also incredibly varied. There's dread, excitement, sadness, silliness, seriousness, feel-goodness, utter creepiness, courage, prejudice, growth, hate, and love. Yeah! You really see the whole human spectrum in this chapter. A very good basis taken to the final confrontation against OD-10. Yeah, the twist is kind of obvious if you watch any sci-fi flick ever made about AI, but the motive is what makes it work. OD-10 expects the best from humanity, which is why it can't compute with the crew being so uncooperative. Every character plays a part in that reasoning, which makes the narrative feel all the more sound and complete. Overall, 
very tight chapter that's able to convey both masterful use of thriller and the depth of various characters. Ironically, it does feel the most thematically humane out of all of them. Even if the chapter is fairly light on combat, what few you do get are enjoyable enough to add icing onto this beautiful bottled cake. Also, points for some of the most clever use of fourth wall breaking I've seen in a while. That's Oh my gosh, number one is the last chapter of the game. I did not see that coming. After the absolute wham episode that was the Middle Ages, the heroes of the other chapters are called to Lucretia so that Odio may crush their hopes with despair. The heroes must band together to stop the original incarnation. So, bad stuff first. Some of these dungeons are really freaking annoying. Oh, and of course Obros is the worst of this freaking cryptic maze bullcrap, because why wouldn't it be? There are a lot of annoying bits at the beginning, such as finding Sundown as a freaking chore if you didn't pick him as the pro tag. And yes, this overworld is designed to be explored and experimented with. And you know, looking back, playing this on stream probably was not the best idea. It is kind of hard to maintain entertainment through some of the moments of downtime and some of the stuff before the ending that I'll get to. Good stuff, pretty much everything else. There is so much to explore and just interact with. Many of the dungeons have some fun gimmicks like cubes, puzzles, and Sundown's time limit mechanic being used more effectively to build dread. And I like that these people are given, you know, time together and depending on the order that you find them in, it can create some fun interactions. Oh, Pogo, you are absolutely precious. What's also satisfying is them fighting alongside each other in combat. The devs really went the extra mile with the amount of dialogue you can get between everybody. And it's all voice too, just icing on the cake. And depending on which character you pick, you get to see how they personally respond to Odio's philosophy, ranging from seeing bits of themselves in him, to gentle rebuke, to simple compassion, to telling him off! Know what your problem is? You blamed everyone else. Said it was them, or gods, or fate that made you what you are. But it was you! Just you. Yeah. People can suck. We could be selfish, look out only for ourselves. But if you focus only on the bad, judge them at the worst, well, you've already made up your mind, haven't you? <laughs> Everything else is just an excuse. Let him cook! Speaking of Odio, let's talk about the boss fight. Purity of Odio is nightmare fuel. And it's amazing. I don't know how they made St. Althea even more terrifying, but they did. Now, yes, the climax admittedly does drag a bit afterwards with the cut scenes, but the rematches are over quickly and holy frick, sin of Odio. The music, the design, and the emotional payoff is phenomenal. Having Arsted himself be the one to finish it off was poetic justice and a completely 100% satisfying ending. Absolutely worth it. And it really ties into the theme of the game, doesn't it? All that hardship and even annoyance, and in the end, it is absolutely worth it to persevere. While things may not work out the way you want, you gotta keep going. This has been Josh Scorcher, and if you can, definitely give Live Alive a try. I'd also recommend playing it in timeline order for a more progressive feeling. Even though Twilight of Edo Japan feels like 12 steps back, just dang it, I freaking hate that chapter!